She successfully introduced new teacher, new teacher contracts, testing programs, teacher evaluation systems, and again, just as importantly, recently concluded a doctoral dissertation from Penn's Graduate School of Education. Without further ado, because no one's here listening to me talk, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, John Sopovich. Thank you. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just set the stage a little bit, and then I'm going to move the podium over so that we're not blocking you folks um, from watching us interact. But So this is a propitious time for us to have this conversation, because in 2001, um, the um, government reauthorized the Education Elementary and Secondary Act and um, instituted something called the No Child Left Behind legislation. And NCLB, No Child Left Behind, um, which, which 10 years ago started, um, really changed the landscape of public education in this country. And one of its pillars was a focus on high stakes testing and accountability, and that's really the focus today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what NCLB focused on before the deluge. <laughs> and then um, we set up this panel to try and get perspectives from different levels of the system. So we have a superintendent, we have a school principal, and we have a high school teacher. So, the, so we, what we wanna do is get the perspective on the influence of accountability over the last 10 years, testing and accountability over the last 10 years, on folks at different levels of the system. So that's our design for um, the panel today. So we have the deluge and the crash bang. So, um, um, so NCLB, the, its features were the institution of annual testing in grades three through eight and one grade in high school, and that line is in your high school, at us in 11th, 11th grade. Um, so Melissa, your school is from? It's 6, 7, and 8 in our high school test. Okay, so, so in your school, 6, 7, and 8, you test in all three grades. Okay. Um, so grades 3 through 8 and 11. Um, and one of the features is that um, results are disaggregated by different subgroups. And the, the importance of that in the legislation is that you can't hide low performance of one subgroup in the average performance for the school, right? So you could have a wide variation of performance, but still a decent average, but you can't hide that low performance if you have to report by subgroup. So that was an important feature, which, which really focused and attended on equity issues. Um, Schools were required to make adequate yearly progress, and that's left up to states to define. So every state, and Robert will probably talk about what it means in Michigan, but every state has a different definition of what progress might mean. The goal was to get every school to proficiency by the year 2014. Well, you know, by my clock, we're getting close to 2014, and um, we're probably not going to reach that goal. But, um, and so that's one of, the, one of the issues and the questions as we, um, 10 years later for No Child Left Behind, as we think about reauthorizing this legislation. Um, schools that didn't move towards making adequate yearly progress um, had a series of increasingly severe constraints and restrictions. So there were uh, different levels of those constraints. So for example, the, the first level is where, um, where the school had to have an improvement plan and students were given the option of attending a different school in their district if they could, if they could find another place that would um, allow them to go. And that moved all the way down to the, the really the highest level of severity is that the school would close and or be taken over by a charter institution or by a private management organization. So schools that didn't reach these improvement targets um, were under the subject of potentially being closed or reconstituted in some way. And um, so those are the testing and accountability components of the No Child Left Behind legislation. And of course there were other components of this legislation as well, but we're focusing on the testing and accountability components. And so here we are 10 years later and the question is, what was the influence of 
that new regime and this new high stakes test based accountability on the education system and that's what we're going to focus on today. This is also important moving forward because the Congress, the US Congress is now starting to think about reauthorizing the um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act and thinking about how should we change No Child Left Behind. And so this is also important in terms of how we look forward. But so today we're going to focus on looking back as well as looking forward. So I'm going to try and slide this over, which probably will. And so that so now we can get um, get the um, you know a full perspective. So let me just start out, and my first question is really. Um, how, has, how are high stakes testing used in your school, in your district? So this is kind of a lay of the land question, right? So just how are, how are high stakes testing and accountability used in your school and or your district? So Robert, can we start? Uh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah. Now we, we actually use the, um, all the provisions of No Child Left Behind uh, in accordance with uh, the Michigan Education, uh, the Michigan Education Assessment Program, meet in Michigan, and so in using all of all of the provisions of No Child Left Behind, uh, two years ago we had 194 schools in the city of Detroit, uh, Detroit Public Schools. Today we have 141 schools, uh, and so as a result of many of us of the testing to determine whether or not those schools met their adequate yearly progress, uh, we reconstituted, we had 24 of the high schools. And as a result of uh, No Child Left Behind, high schools not meeting the adequate yearly progress, uh, we reconstituted 18 of those schools. And the provision that we used, uh, we used the provision where we changed the principles in every other high schools. Uh, we uh, we uh, had teachers apply for positions in those high schools. Uh, and then we went one step further, and that is we uh, provided an outside uh, turnaround team to work with each of the high schools. Uh, not that the high schools were turned over to a turnaround team, but that those high schools had a management partner working with them, uh, with the high school principal. And each of the principals chose the, uh, the partner that they wanted to align themselves with. So 18 high schools were reconstituted, pursuant to much out of the other. We went even further to look at other schools that were not making adequate daily progress, and we reconstituted uh, elementary, middle schools. So at the end of the day, we restructured 40 schools in total. Uh, and again, we changed the school leadership as well as um, gave the new leaders an opportunity to uh, determine the staffing levels coming into the schools. Uh, so that was our approach. Um, we've gone even further. Some schools were closed. Uh, many schools were consolidated. But we used all of the provisions. I mean, there's like one through six, I believe, steps under the child left behind. We found in Michigan, they actually gone even further. I mean, we had schools in phase nine improvement. We couldn't understand phase nine. I thought there were only five phases. Uh, like five phases, but, they, but in Michigan, they went even further. I mean, uh, the first school that I visited when I went to Michigan, the school was in phase nine. Uh, and so we, re, we, re, we, we reconstituted those schools and we changed the principles. We uh, had teachers reapply for their positions uh, in all of uh, those schools. And so that's how we used the provision uh, pursuant to uh, No Child Left Behind to get a handle on, uh, on how, do we begin, how we began to reform uh, the Detroit public schools. And so we were very aggressive in using uh, provisions pursuant to No Child Left Behind, provisions that were not used uh, aggressively in the past because no jurisdiction should permit their schools to go beyond uh, phase five without taking some drastic 
uh, action pursuant to the, to the legislation. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move not sequentially by the panel, but by the the, um, the organizational type moving down. So Melissa, let me ask you the same question. Um, how has high, high stakes testing? How is it how is it used in your school? And if you want to talk about DC as well, that would be fine. Sure. Um, so Alston Middle School is a middle school in the Washington DC public school system with 45 students, 45,000 students, excuse me, in 125 schools. And all those schools are on some sort of range of this sort of accountability system of what different phases, uh, of the different five different phases. Um, and so at the local school level, we certainly can feel it. I mean, just because before coming here today, I called up a colleague who works in the central office. And I said, you know, I'm talking at a panel today about how high stakes testing impacts local schools, and I certainly have a lot of opinions about how it impacts my job and the job of the teachers I really want to work. But I said I was kind of interested in how that impacts your job in some of your office. Is it something that you talk about all the time? Does it come up in conversations? Is that kind of driving the mission of the work that you do? Um, are decisions made based on AYP scores and so forth? And he kind of was like, not really. We, you know, we, we know it's out there. It's something we talk about that it kind of is present. But does it impact central office? Not so much. It didn't, he didn't think it didn't impact the central office very much. Versus at the school, I know the landscape of being a building <coughs> principal in the days of NCLB is very different from being a building principal you know, years ago. So today, as Robert's talking about, he, he is partnering his principals with outside agencies to support them in creating this new sort of school culture, this learning culture for students in the school. And it's hard to find folks um, to, to, to coach principals and teachers in this new era because they haven't done, they haven't been school leaders in the era of accountability of AYP sort of measurement and high state testing. So the, the, the talent pool there to look for people who can then support uh, local school leaders kind of do these turnaround sort of actions is is, is uh, there and I think that's why this is such conversations that we're having today. Um, and I think very much like I think, uh, certainly at the local school level, and in D.C., I'm sure many of you have heard about this in the newspapers and such, D.C. has a new teacher evaluation system where a very large portion of that is based on how a teacher's group of students perform on the high stakes testing. So for some teachers who teach, or so uh, or sixth, seventh, and eighth are all testing grades. So for those teachers who are teaching seventh, seventh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in the area of English and or math, 50% of your evaluation and, um, is based on how, how well your children do. And that's on the value added sort of impact of how that teacher A impacts her students versus teacher A teaching the same sort of group of students. Um, and thankfully, because we've been working on this for several years, we've been at the same school for six years, I think that really does matter. We've been able to build in great PD and just conversations about good teaching and learning in general and try to stay a couple steps ahead of the district in terms of these mandates and now the new standards. So I think our, our, as a school, our school did quite well in terms of value added. Uh, and the um, value added scores actually helped many of our teachers at Deal get significant bonuses for doing well for students. But I know that um, alternatively, there's many other te teachers, most teachers in DC did so fare so well with the value added. So when you're thinking about a new evaluation system that's so connected to standardized testing and you know, all last year teachers were trying to grapple with the idea of how can they not only become better teachers under this new rubric, but also there's a monetary incentive of how do I get additional $25,000 or if they stay high performing for another for two years in a row in the district anyway, your salary bumps up five steps on the union scale. So for some of my teachers, well deserving so, after being high performing once again this school year, some of them will be receiving salaries of $110,000, dollars which is a heck of a lot more than they would on a normal teacher salary scale. So certainly there's national sort of federal guidelines about how desperately we do need our children to perform better academically is then left up to districts to decide, are we reconstituting schools? 
are we um, incentivizing people? Because it's all about people, right? You have the people in your buildings or in your district, and how do you get them to do something differently? Is it through the evaluation system? Is it through regular short cycle assessments and check up on kids to see how they're doing? Is it through data decision making and figuring out who's learning, who's not, who's on the cusp of get, just getting there and who, we, who can we put most of our energy to? How do we start Saturday scholarship programs and bring our kids in for an extended period of the day after school as well as for Saturdays to get them like the seat time that they need to actually make the gaps? Um, so in all those ways. And I think one more thing, and I, and I'm interested in hearing what Robert had to say because I was actually a teacher for five years, well, six years total, but for five of those years, it was actually in a reconstituted school before NCLB, where the school, the district was just so low, it's just a poor performing school that they did just get rid of everyone from the principal down to the cafeteria leads, the custodians, and uh, they kind of really advertised this job as an opportunity for himself to say, you know, here's an opportunity where you create the school and bring people together. Are you interested? And that's how I went to that reconstituted school and experienced amazing, incredible things that can happen with children when people with shared mission can come together to do such work. And today, I wish more schools and reconstitutions would look more like that, where it's um, kind of touted as an opportunity to kind of really change the lives for the young people and the school community versus I think the way many schools today feel about it is you are you are horrible it's because you've gone through all the different phases five or nine and you can't and you can't get yourself together and now you know we're just kind of starting you out in this reconstituted kind of negative space which is a positive space I'm sure that's not the case for all the schools in short but I think for the district level a lot of my colleagues who are really at the very last sort of phase knowing that their school it's more to go this process, they certainly don't feel it as, a, as, as an opportunity. So, um, thank you, Melissa. So, Matt, Madeline, um, you are in a high school where you're, you're down in the trenches, and so, and in a, in a school, in a large high school in Philadelphia, um, only is how large? Uh, we have 1,600 students. 1,600 students. Um, and so, what I'm curious about is how high stakes testing um, plays out in, in your school. Sure. So, let's see. When I came to Philadelphia to work as a teacher in 2004, um, I had gone through my teacher training um, the year before, and even though No Child Left Behind had been instituted, I didn't learn anything about that in my teacher training. So when I came to Philadelphia, started teaching in 2004, I saw a sign that said, congratulations, you made a YP. Um, and at this point, we are now a phase nine school. So we have essentially not made AYP since 2004. Um, it is a Title I school. It is 99% African American students, 90 plus percent in a free, lunch, free and reduced lunch. Um, lot, lots of unhappy, unhappy kids. Um, it didn't really occur to me, though, that high stakes testing was an issue because I didn't teach. In a, in a grade that was that was tested. I taught 10th graders, I taught 12th graders, I stayed in the classroom, I did my thing. Teaching is very isolating, and so I didn't realize what grade basically when a child meant until I moved up into the English leader position in my school. So now I'm in charge of having all these kids pass a state test, which I had not been prepared for. I don't know what my principal was thinking. I had lots of good ideas. I got along with people. Um, and I think that she thought I could use that to, to help move our kids. Um, and our school has been labeled as failing for a very long time. It gets, it gets tiring. It gets very tiring. It gets very psychologically oppressive for the students um, and for our teachers. So. When I became English leader, that was the year that our new superintendent in Philadelphia decided that she would use test scores to identify schools to be turned into charter schools. And so over the past two years, um, she's had this great plan, great plan um, for her um, to <coughs> use, these, use these test scores to turn schools into charter schools. And every year, you're on a list, and you have to find out whether you're going to be rolled over or not into a charter school. So it becomes very, very stressful. 
um, for teachers, and particularly because they don't let teachers teach the kids in a way that gets them to, the, the, to, to passing the test. They tell you how to teach for the test, and then they expect the results at the end. So my teachers, my 11th grade teachers that I work with, they are told this is how you teach, this is the steps, this is the time during class which you will do certain things, and then you are to execute it and we will come in to monitor you. Um, and so my tested teachers are constantly scrutinized, they're criticized, they have no place for creativity, they are discouraged from teaching novels, which is the, you know, the, the essence of an English classroom. And they don't get to do that. They're <coughs> discouraged from teaching extended writing assignments because that's not going to help the kids on the test. And that's for me, I didn't become a teacher to teach to a test. I became a teacher to teach children how to love novels and how to love poetry and how to write their thoughts out. And so, and, and I know my colleagues, they would feel the same, they, they do feel the same way. And so we struggle all year, we wrestle all year. How can we continue to be creative in the classroom when we're told specifically that the things we want to do do not help students for the test? So at the, at the basic classroom level, and as an English leader, it's in my school, again, this is very contextual, we haven't made AYP. Um, and so in my school, it's, it's, it's very stressful. It's very stressful for, for my teachers. Um, for myself, because I want to support them, and for our students who have just basically finished up a month of testing. So we've lost a month of instruction, which is, um, I thought that's what school's about. So let me, let me press on this a little bit, because so one of the theories of No Child Left Behind is a motivational theory, right? So the idea is if we create a system of testing and accountability that will motivate people to, to focus more on the outcomes that are the object of, of, the, of the system, i.e. The, the assessments, right? So, but the question here is whether the motivations that are produced, whether the, react, the responses to those motivations are constructive and channeling energy in ways that are improving teaching and learning or producing unintended consequences, which are actually motiv motivating people to do things which, uh, which are in the service of helping to meet the, the assessment goals, but may not be in the best interest of truly focusing kids on, and teachers on teaching and learn and kids on learning things that they can transfer into skills in the world, right? So we don't want, um, as Madeline um, sort of inferred, we don't want a focus on the test for the sake of the test, but we want to focus on learning that is represented by the test, right? So you know, in test theory, the idea is that the test is a sample from the domain of content that we want kids to master. Right? So in algebra, we can't test all of algebra, so we pick these 10 questions to represent the domain of algebra. And that we, we don't want the kids just to know the answers to these 10 questions, but we want them to understand the domain of algebra so that they can transfer that knowledge into a broader set of, of skills in, the, you know, in their continued education and in their professional so the question I want to ask the panelists is what are the motivations that are produced through the system of testing and accountability and whether those motivations they feel are constructive to helping to improve the system and to increase the focus on teaching and learning. So Robert, that's a tough question, but I'm going to start with you. Well, it's not, <clears throat> the question's not that difficult. Uh, how does one get into a graduate's program at the University of Pennsylvania? Um, one provides a portfolio of a broad range of, of things. And one takes a test, right? Well, you, yeah, you, you, you can, but you don't oh, yeah. necessarily have to take the GRE. Oh, well, so did you take the GRE? I did, but Penn did it required, but I... Oh, I have to go home and tell my son that. <laughs> <laughs> You should tell your son Patrick. That is a fine place, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, 
What we do, we've gone one step further. Uh, we have, and it has been somewhat controversial among teachers, in particular the uh, Detroit Federation of Teachers. We have quarterly assessments uh, that we require. And, and even for a kindergarten, I mean, even pre-K, uh, all the way through high schools, we have these quarterly assessments. And the quarterly assessments are designed, in particular, they really math, English language arts, uh, science. And the quarterly assessments are designed, it's like a one hour test uh, assessment, but they're designed to determine uh, how much, how well, I mean, what did the teach a student, what have we taught the student during that quarter, and how much of what was taught was in fact retained. And it gives us an opportunity to know where each child is. Uh, and then those children, I mean those students, the, the uh, results are reviewed with the students and with the team of teachers. In many cases, we want the principals to lead the discussion, but I can't say that that occurs 100% of the time. And so those quarterly assessments are designed to find out where the, the students, where they are, in a particular subject, and then what plans can be designed to help those students move further along. Uh, and then at the end of the, the four, the four tests is given just before uh, finals, uh, or immediately after finals, I think before finals, to determine what uh, additional instruction should be provided to those students who choose to go on to summer school. So, that's how we use the uh, quarterly assessment. Now, some of the uh, classroom teachers as well were spending too much time testing students. Uh, but the test itself is only one <coughs> hour and out of a, you know, per quarter, but the results then, or the data from those tests are used to drive student performance, as well as to find out whether or not the teachers are performing as well. And so, Again, it has become somewhat controversial among teachers uh, as well as among uh, some principals and among the uh, Detroit Federation of Teachers, but uh, we, you know, we've gone forward with it because we believe that we need to know, if we're going to have a data-driven system, we need to be, a, we, we should use the data to help drive student achievement. And those assessment gives us a good benchmark as to where each student, where they are in their learning, and what additional instructions should be provided uh, to those students, particularly in the uh, in the core subject uh, areas. And we just started that this past year, and so we're hoping that the Detroit Public Schools continue the, the quarter assessment. Um, we ended up in court as a result of it, uh, and but you know that's one way in which we we. we I mean, that's one way in which we're using you know, the, the test to drive uh, student achievement. Now, we haven't gone the next step, and it is to use the results uh, to determine real accountability. I mean, that will be the next step in the process. And are you moving in that direction? Well, the next administration will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so um, Melissa, the question is, the extent to which the motivations of the accountability system that's been constructed over the last decade are um, producing um, constructive um, consequences and constructive actions on the part of um, the faculty in your school. Well, so during my six-year tenure, um, the first four years where it was just federal sort of and district level motivations, if you're going to call them, yeah. of going down these phases, right? Or staying as a high form school, or moving down these um, phases where there's more um, kind of shackles and restraints put on your school for not performing. So I guess that has been, we were experiencing that for four years, and then for the last two years, um, our district decided to kind of implement this new teacher evaluation system and this um, new incentive pay structure as a part of the motivation. And I'll say, you know, teachers certainly can be motivated by money. Certainly they want to 
do well, teach their students well, and perform well on this particular, as measured by this particular test, so that their salaries would certainly increase and plus will be had. And this um, summer is the very first time they felt the kind of joy that that could bring. Um, so they, so the teachers who actually received the certificate certainly love that. But certainly the opposite side of that, the teachers who didn't receive the money, then felt like, wow, this money is actually for real, and this person got it, and I didn't. Like, what are we doing different? So, like, one of the unintended consequences of in the school building is figuring out, whereas some teachers are doing well, like teachers who don't do well this year, I'm finding that they're very much focused on <coughs> what they need to do to do well on that particular rubric to um, just kind of teach them that sort of style or just teach that particular content to receive. Um, Monetary gains, which which you know is, is natural, right? And we have a nice little carry, and we try to get them to work toward that. But the negative end is also there's a consequent monetary consequence of if you don't do well with your students, then you know after certain numbers of years, your your job is no longer with the district, which I think is uh, for district public school very important thing. I would say you know if I group my teachers on like the high performing teachers and the middle of the road teachers and then like the not so great teachers, I think our uh, evaluation system is going to be great for the not so great teachers because it does give the school leader leverage to say, it's not working out, we have to go, there's no um, sort of job owed to the person when they're not performing. I will say that if the evaluation system hasn't at all really dramatically changed what high performing teachers do, because they're going to be fabulous teachers no matter what they're being evaluated by, they're going to make the right gut decisions to teach that novel even if their principal says no, and <laughs> they're doing great things in the classroom. And then for the middle level people, which is I, I think where the bulk of the people think, right? I think um, this evaluation tool is yet to be proven, and right now I want to say it's great that it's given us common language and how, how we talk about what the teaching and learning is, but, but it certainly is having my folks really focus on just that. And, some, some, and I think they're kind of, they've lost the vision of the whole sort of lesson or the whole child in that particular lesson. So that, that is certainly a little bit concerning. And I think you know, only years will tell if we'll move them out of that middle zone to, you know what, I know for this second year you're really focused in, focused in on your bonus pay, but this is how we're going to get to that particular bonus pay without looking at just that rubric. And that's one of the ways that I think school principals can really make some really key decisions. So for example, I just like John was saying earlier, we're not teaching, we don't know when you run a high stakes test that your student, child, learned all about it. We only know certain specific objectives and standards that your child might have learned or might not have learned. So to teach that particular test will always only result in that particular equation, right? So what school leaders can do, what we've done at our school, is to say, forget the test. We certainly want our kids to be really well prepared for the test, but teaching to the test is not going to get us there. Let's just kind of leave that to one side and try to teach our kids to uh, the IB curriculum, which is what we've integrated and say, for, if we can get our kids to match and reach the IB standards for learning, then absolutely our kids will certainly fit whatever standardized test that we're asking of them at the end of the school year. So a lot of our teacher planning and driving and push up rigor um, has been we reach a higher sort of standard so that obviously in the triple down effect, can't believe I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we would definitely, without question, get that, um, I, what I, which I think is more the standard sort of, of the, the uh, assessment system. So that's kind of one sort of way. And I think that is the other motivation that we haven't yet talked about, of what Madeline said about teachers don't come to teach to like make a whole bunch of money. Maybe they will three five years and continue to go down this road of high performance pay and performance pay linked to teachers, which I do think is a, you know, interesting conversation in education today. What they do with the teachers in my building, since they have, you know, they decided to be teachers in several different they really want to feel good. They want to feel good about the impact they're making with their kids. They want to know that 
their daily toils, their night work and weekend work really does change the life of the youngster in the classroom that they're working with. So I think that sort of motivation is also something that local school principals can really have an impact on by constantly kind of bringing the conversation back to that and kind of feeding the teacher that kernel that they need to certainly feel and be reminded of every single day because when we talk about the test, it doesn't hit that feel good spot. So we have to kind of remind them why we are trying to get our kids to this particular level. And I'm sure for Detroit, I go from DC, too many of our kids just don't even meet that minimal bar that our standardized test actually tests. So that data is you know stark enough for us to work really hard at it. But we look too deep at just the data and get kind of tunnel vision with just what the data says, I think we sometimes forget how badly our kids are faring and how they're not going to be ready to be college graduates if we just don't do it. So on a regular basis, just a, you know, certainly with a monetary incentive and motivation, we try to do a lot of like pluck the heartstrings motivation to kind of get us mission focused. So what about, uh, just one follow-up question, what about um, subjects that they don't have testing for? So if I'm a teacher, I can't get the bonuses if I'm not in a, in a tested if you subject. Don't, yeah, yeah, if you're a great teacher and your That's performance a um, is great, you do get a bonus, but not as much as the, the tested subjects. But how do you, so how do you judge? Based on the rubric of teaching the, and teaching learning framework is what we call it. The so there's nine the different descriptors yeah. of what we want you to do. A different nine, though, right? The, all the same nine. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. 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 A different nine. Right. 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 Yes. Okay. So based on those observations, and the, each teacher receives five observations, three from me and three from uh, and two from uh, another teacher. Okay. Okay. So you, so you, so in addition to a test-based system, you have an observation yeah. system, which is an important additional system in, in DC. Okay, so um, so the, the the question now is again sort of how this motivational system of external accountability is produced. What consequences are there of that system that's trying to focus on um, trying to focus teachers on teaching um, and which is measuring um, um, instructional success? through the assessment system. So Madeline, how's that influencing teaching practice in your school? Well, I actually wanted to go back to the, um, the quarterly, if I could, is, is that related? So sure. in Philadelphia, we do have at the high school level the quarterly assessments as well. And one of the things that's really useful about that is you get the results immediately. So you know where students are lacking, you know where they're doing well and where you can move on. Um, However, when we have the state test, we don't find out until June whether our students have done well or not. So there's no time to actually change your instruction. Um, so in that way, for me and for, 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 for our school, the state test becomes just an a, a, a number, an indicator, but it doesn't become anything useful for instruction because the following year we get a whole new set of kids with new problems or you know strengths and we have to you know start the whole um, preparation all over again for them. Um, so quarterly testing, Philadelphia has accepted this. So maybe you want to talk to somebody down there because we've, we've accepted it. We're okay with it and that's in the core, the core subjects, English, um, math, social studies, and language. Um, one, I think one of the problems with that and which you alluded to was that Subjects that aren't tested, those teachers really get, or even grade levels that aren't tested, those teachers really get to fly under the radar. Um, so in that way, testing does help show who the good teachers are, but at the same time, not because not all subjects are tested, you know, there's certainly teachers who are flown under the radar and, and aren't, they don't get recognized for, for their weaknesses or their strengths if they're a good teacher. So at least that's how it is in Philadelphia. Um, in terms of instruction for, my, for teachers, um, what else? I think that's all I have at this point. So I think that, one, that what we've heard from the panel is that this system that originally focused on trying to induce external motivation 
has sort of evolved in a, at least a couple of these cases um, towards a system where the assessment, people are recognizing that a one-time annual test isn't providing information back to teachers, right? So it's, it's, it's producing motivational effects, and there's a slew of research that talks about how teachers respond to accountability systems. There's no question teachers respond to accountability systems. There's a lot of research that says that those, those responses may not be that constructive all the time. So they might be focused on more test prep, or they might be focused on, um, on um, actually, actually gaming the system in some way. So getting kids not to show up for school, or, um, or having kids classified into special ed or into English language learners who may be exempt from taking the test or in a variety of ways. But what we're seeing from the panel, which is kind of interesting, is this evolution of the system into saying, well, if, the, if this high stakes assessment is producing motivational effects, it's not providing much information, not much feedback to teachers about what to do next, right? So if I see kids performing at whatever level on the, the test, how do, how do I move their, their understanding forward? And that's really what the quarterly, quarterly assessments are about and um, in both Philadelphia and Detroit. This idea that the tests should provide information back to teachers that can inform the question about what they do next. So that's the next question I want to pose to the panel is, what do they see as the next evolution of the assessment systems as we try and mature these ideas of using testing. So we tried motivation, and that provided some influence, some bang for our buck. But now we're saying that we need to find alternative supplements to that system to provide feedback to teachers. So what do you see, where do you see this going? Where do you see this moving? I can't speak. <clears throat> I can't speak for industry, but you know, from from my own observation, I see a much deeper use of the uh, quarterly assessments. So that, you know, from from pre K through twelfth grade, uh, with feedback not only to the students but to the teachers, and that the uh, building principal use that information to help guide student, student performance. Uh, I see more of that. I think it can be, and on Detroit, we can probably, it can become a much more robust system than it currently is. Um, but I see that as a very important part of knowing where students are and what interventions uh, should, intervention, intervention should be, that should be taken early uh, as opposed to later. Uh, in, the, in the students' um, uh, performance. So I'm a huge believer in, in the assessments on an ongoing basis with feedback, but that the feedback is actually operationalized uh, with individual students and then the information passed on to school counselors, not just the classroom teacher, uh, school counselors, uh, as well as parents and guardians of those students. Uh, and so everyone plays an important role in how well that those students are going to perform over a long period of time. So that's, I mean, I can't speak of, for an industry itself, but just more uh, micro. So, but let me ask you, as, as the leader of a system, what new knowledge and skills does that require of folks, of teachers and school leaders to have? Well, it may, it, in some extent, it may change the entire way in which we provide professional development for teachers. Um, it may change the way we provide professional development, you know, for the school leader. Uh, because at the end of the day, I hold the building leader responsible for how well that school performs. Um, it also provides, uh, in our case, important information for a group of teachers that we've actually pulled out of the system, uh, that those teachers make up our peer system review team. And 
some of these are nationally board certified teachers, uh, some are master teachers as it were, and those teachers provide individualized coaching uh, for teachers who aren't performing well uh, in the system. Uh, and their evaluation is also part of the overall evaluation of how well a teacher performs. But their goal is to improve classroom management, make sure that the core content areas are being taught well, um, to look at the data uh, with respect to students in, 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 in individual classrooms. And what, we find, what we're finding is that teachers themselves are reaching out uh, to the uh, peer system review team as opposed to a principal who may have an issue with respect to how teachers performing, reaching out to the peer system review team. Uh, these are teachers working with teachers to help to perform, help them uh, in terms of A, the classroom management, and B, the, um, the, the things that they can do and should be doing to drive student achievement, to, um, to increase student performance. So Melissa, let me focus on a particular aspect that you talked about. So um, one of the um, areas that's going un undergoing a lot of, of emphasis in, um, in education and educational research is this idea of trying to isolate the contribution of a teacher to a student's learning, right? So if you have a student who, who is high performing and goes into a school and they leave high performing, then the question is, was it their home factors that really produced their high achievement, or did their teachers actually contribute to their gaining knowledge and skills? So that's the idea of rewarding teachers for their value added. So where do you see that going in DC? Um, I think it'll stick around. I think it's, uh, we're certainly in our initial stages of the value added, and just actually this week we actually did a whole PD with teachers about actually showing them the formula of how the value added score was created. Because last year they received the value added score and it was kind of like, well, how did this, where did this number come from? And so that's been a lot of uh, questions for teachers. So this year we've done a much better job of uh, trying to ex explain how that math works. Mm -hmm. So Do you understand that process? Um, I'm just beginning Be to <laughs> I'm just beginning to understand. Okay, a test. <laughs> Um, I'm just beginning to understand it, but basically it's about, for us, taking um, this group of students, this group of students, compared to, so for example, I'm a teacher teaching hundreds of kids, and this is my hundred kids of caseload. Um, they're using hundred kids' data of the same sort of like race makeup, economic makeup in general to see like how they what an average game would look right. like and see if they exceed the average. Right. So the, the most basic term that's how that's kind of done. And you see like a plus seven or minus seven depending on if you actually helped the child like seven gradients up or like you were your if that was also low, then your child actually regressed during the school year. So and that has an impact on your evaluation system. And I think it's, um, I think that part will definitely stick around for a while, and I think it'll only get much more refined as we actually use, even though know, we talked about the term data-driven work all the time, I do think the way many retailers are figure out like what you bought, how you bought it, and when you bought it, and how often you buy it, I do think we have the numbers smartness to be able to figure that out, and we'll just figure out a better sort of value added every single year that we'll do that. Event. I think the, issue, the question you had asked earlier about the early assessments and where we're on that, I didn't even mention that when we went around talking about that because we've been doing that for so many years now because it's just kind of a, kind of like the air we breathe every you know, quarter we just kind of take the assessment and get the test results back and we sit around and have these data chats like Robert was saying, and I need to the teams, so my assistant principals need to teams, and we have these chats. And I kind of feel like with our school district, the pendulum is kind of, I'm hoping, I don't know if this is me projecting what I want to see versus what will happen, but I'm actually hoping the pendulum will go a little bit more less to the right and to the left to kind of a place where we're using the quarterly assessments in a more focused sort of way, because there's a lot of data that comes all at once. And our teachers, have too many competing goals to kind of focus on. So I, I do think we're 
me in our school, it, it's helpful for them when I kind of mine through them, <coughs> give them like two or three kind of, out of all this, this is kind of what we need to do with the books about because I think what it gets to the individual student downloads we get, which is great, it's just way too much to like kind of deal with for them, so it's really helpful for us to kind of get past that. And I really do hope that Pendulum kind of goes back to teaching the whole child and understanding that that quarterly assessment is just one sort of data point. And I do think that as our teachers get smarter, and I, you know, in our, it's certainly not smart in general, but smart about the process of this uh, quarterly assessment thing, they are asking like tougher questions about, well, I'm not quite sure that this quarterly assessment that is produced by this particular manufacturer, because this education reform is a business, like it's a big, huge business, like is actually connected to what our kids need to learn and what I actually taught. So they're now asking like the tougher questions of asking if these quarterly assessments actually measure what we keep telling them this quarter measure. And they're asking really great questions. We, and now we're at the point, point where we're actually emailing the companies back saying this is a really crappy question, here's why. And, and so we're doing a lot to sort of push back with them, which I hope will get us better tests. And I think there's some question about maybe we're going to change our company. But whether, whatever company it is, there's always a lot of questions and I think sort of error. And I think as our teachers are getting into a group of uh, analyzing test scores every single quarter, they're, they're able to ask the tough questions. So I do think that maybe the swell of our teachers' feedback to the nation will be, if you're going to ask me to make these huge changes for the kids, which I sh what I need to do is important to do, I also need you then to give us the uh, clear tools for ass assessment that will actually measure and tell me what my kid knows and does not know, so that I don't have to just waste too much of my time kind of in the muck of things. So that's kind of what, what, what they always say. And I'm so glad that Robert talked about how at the end of the day, he, the accountability is on that particular building here because, yeah, I, I feel that that's one of the things I should have talked about earlier that I didn't talk about. That when I first started being a school leader, um, it was pre all of this. So I didn't quite understand what the world I was walking into. And certainly I jumped in, I kind of love it, and this whole thing is kind of the, it's in my blood that it gives, it gets me excited. But it is incredible. Like for, I know we're here talking about it, and I, we have so many more teachers in our nation than so many principals. <laughs> But I think the accountability is certainly the way I feel that our district does it and the way Detroit does it, certainly. I'm sure for most urban school districts. It is really the, the seat of the principal. I mean, we talk about how accountability and teacher incentives are kind of tied to it and so forth, and certainly the teachers' unions in general are so much stronger than principal unions if they exist at all. So we do have a lot of these incentives in place to like recognize good teaching and how to support good teaching. There is no such thing that I know that exists for building principals just, I think, really where your equation will either go with positive or negative. And um, I'd like to see some more research, John, on <laughs> figuring out how that sort of lever can be leveraged in different ways to support the building principles. That's my plug. Um, I'm going to ask a little follow-up to Melissa, and then I'm going to ask Madeline a question. And I'm warning you, then we're going to open up for questions. So be thinking about what your question is. So everybody perked up a little bit when I said that. Uh, <laughs> So, Melissa, just yes. a little follow-up. I was wondering if now that teacher value added is associated with bonuses, if in the summer and fall you get lobbying for kids to go to particular classes. Wow. Well, no, I will say no to that only because I cut that out many, many years ago. We have lots of other structures in place. For a child, you have a sixth grader at our school is a team of people, and I stack that team with like fabulous teachers. So every single team had like high flyer superstar teachers, as well like, you know, not such wonderful teachers, but they're really good teachers anyway. So like, even though you might really like love this one teacher, I would say all of our teams are equal, but here right. I but, but, but it's interesting that the that choice that. of the <laughs> unit of reward and, and sanction is the individual teacher as opposed to the team, right? Yeah, which is true. which is kind of interesting. Oh, that's interesting. So, Madeline, yes. Um, um, you you've seen this experience from both sides of the fence. You said you started out by not being in a high test grade. You know, so I'm not asking you how long you've been a teacher.
teacher because that's akin to asking the woman her age and I couldn't do that. Um, but so you've seen this from the side of the fence of, of being in a low stakes grade in maybe a high stakes environment and being and being seeing the high stakes um, come to come to play. So I, I was just curious about what you see as the biggest influence of this last Ten years, or but or your experiences, the influence of high stakes testing just net on the um, on the life of teachers. Wow! So you have to sum up the last ten years. Oh goodness! So one of one of the reasons I was so excited to come down here was because you know, and I think about my experience um, as a teacher who became you know, a, a teacher leader at my school, and I see the pressure that, that my colleagues go through. And you know, they're my colleagues, they're my, my friends. We spend time together outside of school, and yet it's, it's, it's insanely pressurized. When you're in the building, in the moment, you're working with kids, you don't want your kids to fail, you don't want to be seen as a failing teacher. You don't want your school to be seen as a failing school. It's very, it's, it's a pressure cooker just waiting to explode. Um, and frankly, what I would love to see, um, and maybe this will be at least the next, I don't know, maybe next year. What I would love to see is an absolute moratorium on testing. Like, none. Give the kids a break, give the teachers a break, give the principals a break, give the superintendents a break. Let's save all that money, put it aside, and let's just give the students an opportunity and the teachers an opportunity to learn, to be learners. Um, I don't feel that testing is going away anytime soon, but in my utopia of school, you know, there, there, is, there is no test. Or, or if there is a test, it's a test that counts for the students' lives. So at the end of the year, a 9th and a 10th grader would take the PSAT. At the end of the year, an 11th grader and a 10th grader would take the SAT. A 12th grader, they would take the AP exam. You know, exams that counts for students' lives. Whereas a state test, there's no college that will accept a state test as an admissions criteria. So for me, I would like to see those kinds of tests um, count more. And I would like to see teachers teaching at that higher level as compared to a state test is often very simple. It's, it's hard to teach simple things. It's ironically and nonsensically, that doesn't make sense. But teaching basic stuff is not always easy. When you get the kids to think at a higher level, they can do it. They just need to have opportunities. So I'm sure that there would be testing companies who would not like to hear that we should have no test for the next year. Um, but I just, I, I wonder what that life would be like. And for me, I'm always looking for the hopefulness of school. So if testing is to be, that's okay. I can live with it. I teach AP students. I'm blessed. My kids want to be in school. They want to learn. But I know that my colleague down the hall who teaches, oh, 10 special ed kids in every single class, she doesn't have the same luxury as I do. So just to alleviate some pressure. We live in such a high pressure society. But, I mean, that's, that's utopia for me. Um, I would love to see that. So I just want to point out that, that um, what you raise is a really important um, kind of irony about this system, that the target of accountability is often the district from the state, or the school from the district, or the teacher from the district or whoever, but the student who whose performance that we're measuring this on is usually doesn't have stakes attached to their performance, except if they're in high school and it's to graduate or something like that. But you know, for kids who are in middle school or elementary school, often there is no real stake attached for them. So that's kind of an irony of the system. So what do you mean? What do I mean that when the kids in the lower level? Well, so, so a, how a fourth grader performs on the state assessment um, has no, there's no implication, there's no stakes attached for them. The teacher might respond differently to them, but unless you have a non-social promotion policy, there's no stake attached to that. For every, for every grade? Yeah. Okay. So then, so then do you that? 
you got you got you got to talk about that. Well, because you know, I just ended out of the you know, out of the social promotion. I mean, it has a cost associated with it, but uh, by you know promoting a kid from fourth to fifth grade when they have a master of their core subject. Content areas, you haven't done that child a favor. You know, particularly in urban kids who have significant challenges competing in a world well beyond where they're being educated. And they have to be given, you know, every opportunity to, to succeed. And you're not helping move along kids. I mean, you shouldn't have a child in the 12th grade reading at the sixth grade level. How did they get out of it? To the 12th grade. Oh, you have children promoted to ninth grade, but you know they they've had I mean, they can't master um, you know basic algebra, and so you never you're not doing them a favor. So the extent to which you're assessing high state testing. <laughs> kids early on, uh, you're helping those children, you get letting it, they're finding out where they are and then it's the obligation of the education system to help them move beyond where they are. So that, and you're, I think you're an anomaly in, in school districts to do that, but tell me um, how many years that's been in place and <laughs> How the a year, and so a year, <laughs> and so it's yet to be seen how the whether that influences sort of how kids approach these tests. Well, absolutely, I mean, you need long. It's a research opportunity. Yeah. Correct. That's what I was about to say. Uh, if it's continued in Detroit, but it, it is definitely. Um, I mean, we like we, had, we have about seventy-two thousand students. Um, about 26,000 students who are not at grade level, two or three grade levels behind, probably more. I mean, I mean, 26,000 over age for grade three, which means there are they're behind in many ways. And so you have to you, you, know, you use the information and data. You have to focus on those kids. I was going to ask a question of uh, Melissa. Um, you know, if you when you're rewarding students, I mean teachers, and we had this new teacher evaluation system for the first time in the Trevor schools, um, had it much after, like the, the system here in DC, um, the system in um, Arizona, there, Denver, Denver, a couple of others, so we just picked and choose the best systems that we thought. But what happens, you know, you, you know, you're rewarding teachers at a high level. And we provide very extensive after-school program, an extended day program for all the students, um, particularly uh, pre-kindergarten through eighth grade, in their co-content areas. So, what's being taught in the classroom, they're getting a double dose at the end of the day, and it's the result of what. And so, you're measuring. Should you measure what's taught during the normal school day? versus what, I mean, how do you bring the extended day learning into the regular classroom learning? And then for those parents who then have special tutorial programs for their children, get them to another level, and who takes credit for that? How does that become, the, how do you factor that into the teaching about system? Or even in a high school teaching about situation where we have, um, not called extended day, but it's you know double dosing in mathematics, double dosing in English and reading. Uh, this is after school. And so how does all that factor into the teacher evaluation? So I get my twenty five thousand dollars bonus. I don't know. We don't have. <laughs> I think you're double dosing model. Well, I think is amazing. Invest that much time with the kids because that's what kids need. Right? They need additional time to get from this content. <coughs> well, I think that you posed that question, and I think, wow, I guess in that same way, um, 
we never, we don't really know, because learning for kids and for all, all of us is not linear, you make growth spurts and when you learn. So you might be, you know, you might think to jump in now I class when really now I don't know that. Because, you know, John or something like that. I taught him two years ago and, and those things just finally clicked for you with now class. So I don't know, that's a great question. Never thought about that. There you go. So we're open, the floor is open to questions. Um, so why don't we start with, I can't read name tags, so that hold me. Sarah, thank you. So I would probably just start out, uh, so I actually work, um, and I fund education projects and technology related. I work with Hewlett Packard, and we do, um, we do uh, a lot of philanthropy in education in America and globally. Um, and my question really goes to, I think, accountability and beyond. Because I think when you, when you talk about accountability, you have to understand what are the broader issues that go into preventing good teaching and learning. And we as funders often ask ourselves, well, what can we do to help? So I'd be interested in the opinion of the panelists on this, because the United States, in spite of spending $10,000 per student per year, on average, our test scores are significantly lower. Um, on PISA scores across the globe, we tend to perform, particularly in math and science, much lower than other OECD countries. Um, we spend more than South Korea gets much better results than we do, um, spending much less per child. And in Canada, they are one full grade level ahead of the United States on average. And yet, we've tried these experiments in accountability. We've tried to really push and at least address you know, the worst schools. And obviously, you know, a lot of teachers don't like this. Um, they feel like it doesn't focus on the right thing. But is it really the accountability issues, or is there some other fundamental structural problem that we are just failing to address? Is it that we can't attract and, and retain the teachers? Is it that, that parents aren't doing enough in the home environment to support their kids' education? Is it the money is being spent uh, incorrectly? Um, or is it just that our accountability system is flawed or a combination of the above? You know, I would just be interested to know what, what is your opinion on that? Well, I think we have it all backwards. Um, in terms of, um, you know, we put a lot we bring a lot of issues to the um, to the classroom, uh, to the campus, to the school, public school campus. Uh, but and we focus a lot on the achievement gap. But there is not enough focus on the preparation gap. In other words, how much time we're we spending from zero to three. For example, you know, in, in either areas where it's not the public school system as, as such, it's the entire system. You know, for example, you don't get you know, poor prenatal care impacts negatively on child ability to learn. Poor postnatal care impacts negatively on the child ability to learn. Child grows up in a household filled with lead-based paint plays on the playground with all kinds of lead-based paint, lives in a neighborhood where asthma is a big issue, based on environmental issues, all those things have a negative impact. Child grows up in a household where by the state standards, the parents are functionally illiterate, child is exposed to few words, um, violence, unemployment, mental health, all those things, child growth up in that household in those neighborhoods, all impacts negatively on the child. And then when the child reaches age three, and we ship them off to the schoolhouse. And we take them to the school, you're held responsible. That's now your responsibility to educate that child. Although the education actually should have started, you know, at zero. And I'll use an example, crude though it may be, if you take this building, I think we're on the 13th floor, you know, the architects to the design, you know, met to design this building, 13-story building, first thing they thought about is, uh, many of the things they thought about, what is the foundation that's going to support this infrastructure? 
So when we look at the Trinity Cloud Research by one. So when we look at the whole education system, we're not spending, I think coming here from the US Department of Education, uh, we're spending money in the wrong direction. We're not spending enough money on the front end. We're not investing, I don't know, we might spend we're not investing on the foundation. We invest after the problem um, that occurred. Now, and then particular African American boys, you know, they enter school and we say, well, acting up, can't read, therefore special ed. So if you even in DC, you just survey DC, if you take 30 zip codes in DC, you have more African American girls enrolled in uh, special education than any other. So long I want my soapbox right now, so I'm gonna get off Long story short, the preparation gap is where we should be investing before the child reaches our classroom. Can I take what you said build a little bit on that? I actually think um, we've done a lot. We're certainly much better at the preparation gap than we used to be with the Head Start program. And now we're thinking about more about pushing head, or even earlier than Head Start with like early, uh, what is it, early in the day, but we're trying to figure out for birth what students repeat support, what you're looking for, and how we support those parents. I think for some reason, just being a new parent myself, um, and not only new parents, but new people, I'm finding that there's a lot of attention that's given to little people. I think parenting becomes a whole different ball game when little people get a little bit older, and they start pushing back and talking back, and we don't really teach our parents how to parent that child. So part of what we are going to look at next year at our school is talking about like parent education for the adolescent student. And if, in my perfect world, I would actually start that in elementary school about like third grade, fourth grade, when the, the, that pushback is coming at parents more and you're still kind of remembering how cute they used to be. But like in that middle school, I really do see that parents are often like unsure. I mean, they want to do something. I mean, this is their beloved child. They want to do the best they can but they just have so little tools in their toolbox because maybe they didn't experience great time on their own and there's not you know, time of the day for them to actually get, go take a course on it or something like that. That's just not the culture of maybe very, very uh, busy, often single parent homes. So I really do think um, a school, if you're thinking about funding some things, I think you should think about like, how can we just not be talking about accountability, testing, testing all the time, but think about like the whole sort of community and how do you take like for example, in Detroit, or you see multiple generations of people have been failed by our school system. And to, to kind of just focus just on kids right now, I think doesn't really make the quick impacts we need to make, so I would say think generationally. And then I want to also kind of talk about, I think there's something to, I think John, you did a study on implementation, right? So there's all sorts of reform models or corrective measures that one can invest into. But where it really like can produce is in how it's implemented and giving it the time to be implemented and go through the implementation dip and then bounce back from that because people are kind of getting into training the new peers and trying to, trying to learn new skills and make new connections. And I think, um, and Robert did something about if this retention thing is continued in Detroit. Now, I'm not quite sure I can completely agree with Robert on the retention thing, but there's, he's a smart guy. I'm sure he's thought this through, and he's decided for his school district, this is what they're gonna do. And if this gets continued, the great things might resolve. But in urban school districts, I mean, we have superintendents who turn over like there's no tomorrow. It's, it's almost a financial gain for our superintendents to leave. <laughs> we they buy you our contract out and go somewhere else. And it's like it's a pretty phenomenal thing of how quickly our leaders at the top are kind of, kind of turning through cities. And in the same way, I would say at the school level, I think uh, we we just started seeing great gains at my middle school at my year four because it took three years to really restructure things, move really crazy people out bring new people in, to go through like a PD sort of learning together. It takes that time for a school principal to kind of get that done. And I sat through so many other job offers and kind of 
teasing things through the you know, last few years for me about I could go do something else. And you know, it might be in my financial best interest to do something else. It, you know, kind of you know, all those things, but I really do think if we think about if you really what you're really in for is fixing something, it really needs uh, sustained leadership, whether that's at the city level, whether that's at the school level, whether it's you know, you're supporting doing the wisdom permit chair and she's not doing exactly what you want to do with the principal, so do you kick her out and get somebody else or do you try to kind of work with her through that sort of system? But sort of like something that gets the people invested in staying for a bit of time. Because you know, he's you know, Mr. Mr. Bob will get a job somewhere else. And he's a highly accomplished man. I will certainly get a job somewhere else if that's not an issue. But who won't get good support if people just kind of flutter about is the communities that really need to be built and intact. So I would love for your organization to think more about like how do we get that? How do we create like the norm? of leadership to be not just get a couple of notches in my belt in this particular thing and then we come forth before that thing, whatever it is that you're trying to create with investment time and energy, gets to actually like kind of as a chance to flourish. Or do you create a structure, even in a public school system, of a board, a functioning board like many private students might have, that will trust and will be holding that organization like goal and trust no matter what the leadership change. So it's investing in thoughtful leadership transition. So like when I'm leaving my school, you know, is there something structurally in place and not just kind of me to be a good person, but is there some sort of system and structure in place that says we're transitioning another person to take my place and we've given some time and budget money for me to like thoroughly train the person and then like leave it in good hands, right? So other questions. We've got time for a couple more here. Um, in, the, in the back. The, Oh, I know you. Emily. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hi, John. Hi, Emily. John, how's, your, how's your dissertation coming along? It's, it's going great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> John's my chair. Um, so I was a teacher for She's not a plant. I have to No, try. no. <laughs> I surprised you. I, I was a teacher for seven years um, in Boston, and now I'm a graduate student at Penn. And um, first of all, I just want to say this is a great panel, and I can't tell you how many panels I've gone to where there are no teachers. So it's really great that there's a teacher and a principal. Um, and just, it's, it's a good combination. So um, I had two questions, but I'll just ask one now. So there's a lot of research that shows that school culture is a huge component in sort of creating excellent schools, right? From everything from uh, what Melissa mentioned um, in terms of making sure that there's leadership succession um, and things like uh, teacher buy-in and, of course, test scores is a part of that. But it seems like um, this focus on high stakes testing might be at odds with that, um, creating strong culture, for instance, you know, if, uh, when you're using it to decide who, which teachers will get higher pay that seems to create competition, or it might. So I guess I'm just, my question is, in your experience or in your beliefs, um, how do you see that playing out in terms of school culture? So at, uh, at my school in Philadelphia, I, I'm really fortunate that the teachers I work with very much because we don't have, pay, you know, pay for pay per performance. Pay per performance. Um, we very much work as a team. We see ourselves as being we're all in the same boat here. So if our kids don't do well, we're all going down. Um, so we, I feel very, again very fortunate that I work with a team um, who we all share the same goals. So and and we all support each other. And I know that. Um, certainly, there are times where teachers will say to me, well, you teach AP, you don't have anything to worry about. Well, I, you know, the th I tell them, but I share, even though my students are AP students, they all have the same struggles. They all have the same issues in the classroom, um, whether classroom management issues, writing, whatever the, the you know, different 
different struggles that students have. So, at least in that way, I feel I feel good about my team. Um, but if it were to get competitive, I I can't imagine what it would look like. Um, it's already teach again. Teaching is very isolating, isolated activity. So if you break things down, when it comes to people's paychecks, that's a big deal. People you know, people don't want to lose their money. People will do whatever it takes to get you know make sure that they can take care of themselves. And I think by making school competitive in terms of pay. I think personally, I would have I wouldn't feel right getting my paycheck at somebody else's expense. You had a question over here. Yeah, I, uh, my question is, uh, you know, you're talking about the high stakes test. Well, I, I have a feeling you're going to be here for a while. Uh, why not make them fun for the students? You know, I have a I go on Facebook a lot, and I see these boys, or my nephews. Um, you know, they play this game, World of World, War, World, 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 high stakes testing, we went through an era where we really explored alternative assessments, um, more authentic assessments, performance tasks, portfolios, kind of the things that you were talking about. And it came down to two things. One is the cost. So they're more expensive per administration, per student, right? So they're very expensive. And two is if you're going to have a high stakes test, it needs to hold up to the scrutiny of two psychometric qualities called reliability and validity. And these other tests, which were more authentic um, assessment instruments, were, a, um, were harder to get um, these levels of certainty about is, that, is the judgment of performance actually consistent across different people. So I think that the good news is that with technology we're starting to move back towards more these more creative authentic assessments and, and Robert is nodding his head which so I think that we might we might move in that direction now with some of the technological I'm talking about making the preparation for the test. Oh okay. Okay, because you did spend time preparing to teach to the test. Yeah. Let the kids take pre-tests before. What they do with the uh, SAT? Uh, they do take pre-tests. Yeah, There's a lot of them. But depending on the teacher, they become fun and it becomes a game with these kids. You know? And then the big thing, unfortunately, in a big thing game, which they might end up spending a lot of time on, but at least they're spending time on doing something that's productive as opposed to drugs, alcohol, and smoking. So, so I think that's a great plea to close with. Let's make learning fun. <laughs> and let's produce high performance with that fun learning. So Tom, I think you're ready to. Yeah, so just obviously you guys did a great job with John and Alice. Please. Uh,